In the second lecture of section 2.3, I'm going to be looking at the chemistry of cooking. We're going to start by looking at flavour. And what we find is that many flavour and aroma molecules are aldehydes. So we want to explain why are they aldehydes. And to do that, I'm going to pull up three different molecules. An alkane, an aldehyde and an alcohol. Now, to interact with your taste and uh, smell senses, the molecule has to be volatile and turn into a gas. So the effectiveness of aldehydes as flavours has got a lot to do with the volatility. Now, if we look at the alkane, this is a non-polar molecule, so it's non-polar. So the intermolecular force is London dispersion forces, which is very weak. So non-polar molecules, like the alkanes, are very volatile. So volatile, in fact, that they are normally lost from the food very quickly and don't hang around to uh, add to the flavour. If we move to the alcohols, this is a very polar molecule because it's got the OH bond. It's got hydrogen bonding between its molecules, so it's got a very strong intermolecular force between the molecules, which means it's got quite low volatility. So it's not very good at volatility at turning into a gas and interacting with the senses in your nasal passages. Aldehydes, however, in, sort of in terms of flavour and aroma, are in the Goldilocks zone. They're not too volatile, but they're volatile enough. So it's a polar molecule. You know, the C double bond O is quite a polar bond, but it's not nearly as polar as a hydrogen bond. So we get PD, PD interactions between the molecules. And this just gives it the right amount of volatility to hang around for long enough, but still turn into gas and interact with the senses in the nose. It's also worth commenting on is how volatile an aldehyde is will depend on its size. Small molecules are more volatile than large molecules. That kind of go goes for all three of these groupings. Small things, small molecules are more volatile than big molecules. Big molecules have stronger London dispersion forces in addition to whatever PDPD PD or whatever they've got. So the bigger the molecule, the less volatile it is. So aldehydes great for flavour. But what we want to look at is how we can retain that flavour during cooking. And that depends really on the size of the aldehyde. Here we've got a small aldehyde and here we've got a relatively large aldehyde. Now in the small aldehyde we've got this polar group here and this non-polar group here. Whereas if we look at the large aldehyde, the polar group is the same as in the small molecule. But the non-polar section is far larger. So, because this is relatively polar compared with this one, uh, it tends to be more soluble in water. So it's small aldehydes tend to be soluble in water. because they've got, only got a small non-polar part, whereas big aldehydes tend not to be soluble in water, so soluble in non-polar solvents. So, if we want to retain small aldehydes, we do not cook the food in water. If we cook the food in water, small aldehydes will dissolve into the water and be lost with the cooking water. So 
if the flavour is due to small aldehydes, we cook it in oil, in, uh, in terms, certainly in terms of flavour, perhaps not in health, but in terms of flavour, uh, it'd be uh, advantageous. Whereas if the flavour molecules are large aldehydes, we'd want to cook them in water, because these are not soluble water. Moving on now to texture, and within this section we're really only going to look at the texture of meats. And the texture of meat is due to the protein which the meat is made from. And if this is a large protein molecule, the texture is due to the structure of the protein which is determined by the hydrogen bonding you get between different parts of the protein molecule. And if we cook it at a high temperature, we break the hydrogen bonds, so change the structure of the protein and change the texture of the food, normally to something that is more easily uh, digestible and chewable. So it's a bit like denatur well, very identical to denaturing enzymes. The heat breaks the hydrogen bonds and changes the structure of the protein. If it's an enzyme, it denatures it and stops it working. If it's uh, just meat, it changes the texture. Okay, moving on now to look at the oxidation of food, which is in most cases a bad thing. One exception can be in the case of alcohols. Now we know that alcohol in all alcoholic drinks is ethanol. And if it gets oxidised, it turns into an aldehyde, ethanol. Now, as we've just discussed, aldehydes are often very pleasant uh, flavour molecules. So, sometimes a little bit of oxidation can be a good thing. And this is one of the things that happens when you age whiskey or age wine. With a very limited amount of oxygen available, you just get a small amount of oxidation and can produce some aldehydes which add to the flavour of the alcohol. If you do it for too long or have too much oxygen available, however, it can oxidise through to the ethanoic acid, which isn't uh, pleasant tasting. So you wouldn't want oxida to oxidise through to carboxylic acid, but a little bit of oxidation can be a good thing. Normally, however, oxidation of food is a bad thing and we try to stop it. A good example of this is the oxidation of oils and fats, mainly oils to be fair. Now, the oxidation takes place where you've got a carbon-carbon double bond and if you've got lots of carbon-carbon double bonds, you're likely to have an oil and not a fat. So, say we've got our fat molecule, our oil molecule, and it's got, let's just keep it simple, we've just got the one carbon-carbon double bond in there. If that gets oxidised, you break the carbon-carbon double bond and what you produce is a carbon a C double bond O at the end of the chain, in other words an aldehyde, and another one from the other part of the chain. So you break the carbon-carbon double bond and make two C double bond O's, making two aldehydes. Now, as discussed, aldehydes tend to be volatile and they add to the flavour, but you're not guaranteed that the aldehyde is going to smell nice. And these aldehydes, produced by the oxidation of oils, uh, are very unpleasant uh, smelling. And we often use the term rancid to describe the smell of these aldehydes produced by the oxidation of oils. So, what we're mainly interested in then is slowing down the oxidation of food and there's various ways we can do that. We can just keep the food cold, so <coughs> low temperature reduces the rate of reaction, including oxidation. Or we could pack the food, pack the food in a vacuum uh, so it excludes oxygen, so there's no oxygen to oxidise it. Similarly, we could pack it in a nitrogen atmosphere. Many crisps are often, packets of crisps are uh, packaged in a nitrogen atmosphere. 
again to exclude oxygen or we can add antioxidants well, antioxidants as the name suggests uh, stop the oxidation of foods we get natural and artificial antioxidants vitamin C for example is a natural antioxidant it's got the molecular formula C6 H8 O6 and if you have that in your food the vitamin C this is vitamin C will oxidize as opposed to the food and when it oxidizes it loses two hydrogens and two electrons so the vitamin C has been oxidized instead of the food so finally five things you must be able to do firstly predict how volatile a molecule is likely to be by examining its size and structure predict whether a molecule is likely to be water soluble by examining its size and structure explain why cooking changes the texture of proteins describe the reactions of oxygen with alcohols and edible oils and describe ways to prevent the oxidation of foods